I want to continue with my talk on the Gyoji chapter. Gyoji no Hanashi no Tsuzuki o Shitaito Omoimas. Iwanami Bunko de wa Sambyaku Nanaju Loku Peji no Nigyome Kalades. Choki no Elio Osho. Ma Mizuno Yaoko san wa Elin to Furigana o. 売ってます。おそらく医療という読み方は一般的のようです。長期の医療保障は説法家の遜色なり、説法と原社とに従来して産学する金29年なり。その年月に布団二十枚を挫破す今の人の座禅を愛するあるは長期を上げて向こうの消直とす人は王子及ぶ少なししかあるに三十年の工夫むなしからずある時両連を歓喜せし、せしち、波に骨年として大御数。三十来年かつて郷土に帰らず、親族に向かわず、上下剣と断章せず、戦慄に工夫す。死の行事は三十年なり。擬態を擬態とせること三十年差し置かざる力と言うべし大根と言うべし礼儀の剣語なる伝文するは枠十教官なり願うべきを願い恥ずべきを恥とせん長慶に総不すべきなり実を論ずればただ同心なく創業つたなきによりていたずらに妙理には下爆せられるなりまずここまでです長期の栄養書という人についてです。まあまず一番最初に確認のため、まあ今まで何回も言ってきたことですけれども、この行事の末期を道元禅寺がまあ越前の伊平寺に移るちょっと前。に書いた巻です。で、その頃の道元禅寺といえば、ま、28歳の時に中国から日本に帰ってきて、自分の疑問が一応解決した。自分のま、一生の大事が国に終わりということばが確かにあったと思うんですけれども自分の一生の大問題が解決されてでもうそれは自分だけのものにするのはもったいないからぜひ国に帰って都で多くの人と交流を持って、それを伝えたい。また弟子も育てたい。最初は県人にも取ったけれども、どうもまああの師匠の明前禅寺が住職をしてきた県人寺では長く。いられなくて深くさ京都のちょっと南に庵を構えてそしてやがて宇治の高勝寺が立つわけですつまり騒動ができたんですね 
初めて、まあ、道元禅師が夢見た禅修行ができるような騒動ができたわけですがこの行事の巻を書き出した頃にはおそらくもうもうじき都を離れなければいけない。もう越前に移るか移らないかそういう話が出てた頃です。で道元禅師はおそらく迷いがあったと思います。うんなぜかといえば、もちろんあの24歳の年で中国を渡った時は、それこそ命がけで船が沈むかもしれないので、命がけで中国に行くわけですけれども、中国を回ったお寺はみんな大きな寺院だったんですね。あの最後でお世話になった天童山、慶徳寺も当時の大きな寺院で、当時の中国の政府の支援があって運営されるような寺院だったんですね。で、都の建仁寺も、まあ、今は臨済宗の一つの本山となってますけれども、当時はまだおそらく、まあ、あの天台宗延暦寺の別府。このような感じで、要するに、延暦寺を総合大学と例えて言うならば、そこに、まあ、新しく禅学科みたいなものができた。ですから、おそらくあの日本の中学校では、鎌倉仏教について、英才は臨済、道元は相当、法然は浄土、親鸞は浄土、真宗。日蓮は日蓮宗を作ったと言われるけれどもその中でまあ英才禅師と道元禅師以外は一回島流しにあってしまうんですねでそれはなぜかというと解いていること自体つまり念仏とか法華経の題目それは天台宗にもあって修行方法だったけれども天台宗と違ってこれだけやればいいこれが唯一の正しい道であると他のことはやらなくていいという主張ですねで天台宗ではまあ,あれもこれもあれもこれもやってたけれどもむしろ念仏やるならもうそれ以外はできない。題目と題えるならば、もうそれ以外はできない。法華経以外のお経も読まない。で、道元禅師も座禅に対して同じような思いがあったんですね。座禅と並ぶものは何もない。座禅だけすればいい。ですから、おそらく、島流しこそあってないけれども、あの、道元禅師にも、法然さん、親鸞さん、日蘭さんと同じような天台書の圧力があったはずです。だからこそ、まあ、都を離れなければいけなかったんですね。で、英才禅師だけは、ずっと、まあ、都に、行ってうまく、まあ、よく言えばうまくやってたんですね。なぜうまくできてたかというと、まあ、今でこそ臨済宗を日本で成立させた人とされているんですけれども、正式には天台宗に離れてないんですね。結局、まあ、天台宗のお坊さんでずっとやってたんですね。まあ、天台宗の中の、まあ、総合学校。大学の中の全学校の全学科の学長さんだけれども一応天台宗という傘の下
。で、道元禅師も、おそらくこの行事の巻を書く頃には、迷ったと思いますね。ここで、まあ、島流しに会うか、越前の山奥で細々とやるのか、あるいは、まあ、英才禅師のようにもう少し、まあ、上手に天台宗と付き合って、座禅だけが正しいんじゃなくて、まあ、いろんな道があって、その中に座禅という道もありますよという、もうちょっと柔らかいアプローチを取ればよかったけれども、結局、まあ、ここで特に道元,あの道元禅師が気合い入れているのはダルマさんの話ですけれども別にインドを離れる必要もなかったし中国で皇帝と会ってまで理解されなくてなんでこのダルマさんが山に入って9年間面壁したのかというと。話になるんですねそれはもうもっぱら一切主上のサイドを考えてのことであるというそのためにはもうインドのあのまあ熱帯地をもちろん雨もまあ雨が降るんだろうけど雪が降らないような気候に育ったあのダルマさんが寒い思いをして弟子がつくかどうかも全く保証されてないのに山奥で長年修行してようやく弟子が見つかったというそういう話をまあくどいほど書いているわけですねでダルマさんのほかにもまあ今回は長期営業ですしいろんな人が引用されてそれをまあ道元禅師が水からのまあ鏡として使っているわけです。えー、で、まあ、今日は長期エリオ禅師です、えー。説法の弟子。で、あのですから、原者のシビがおそらく彼の兄弟子に当たるわけです。えー、死者の説法や兄弟子の原者に、えー、延べ29年参戦をした。その間、この29年の間は、29枚、ね、20枚の布団が破れた、座破すると。この29年の座禅によって20枚の、まあ布団というのはこの場合は座布のことですね。座布が20枚も破れた。えー、まあ当時の座布。どんなもんだったかわからないけれども私の座布も今はまあボロボロですもちろん30年前、まあ、ちょうど29年前に最初にアンテナに来たその時使った座布と今の座布違うけれども今の座布道中になってから書いたことはあるかもしれないけれどもまあ、何回も,何回も穴が開いてその都度直したりする。で、一つ変わったのは低くなる。いっぱい最初にパンに集めて少しずつ低くなっている。でもそれは私は長い間、あ自分にはちょうどいい。若い頃には高い方が良かったけれども、年数とともに低い方が座りやすいと思うようになった。ところが、その穴が。次々と空いてしまうから今の,あの外のやつを何年前ともみさんが作ってくれたそれは多分あの
まあ、10年以上は持っていると さすがに<笑> やぶりやすいものだったのか。ま、ここで道元前寺はま、いかに彼がもう気合を入れて座禅した証拠だという風に。この言葉を取り上げているんですね。29年の間に20個のザフを座りつぶした。今の人の座禅を愛するあるは長期を上げて、もこの小直とする。え、座禅を心差している人なら大体みんなこの長期営業をま彼に憧れている。彼を目標としている。彼に憧れている人は多いけれども、及んでいる。彼と肩の並べるものは少ない。しかあるに30年の工夫虚しからず。彼のこの30年の座禅工夫は決して虚しいことではなかった。で、ここではこの行事の末期にしては珍しく、あの、悟り体験の話が出てくる
行き詰まりは行き詰まりとして真正面から行き止めて30年過ごした。そこでは逃げることもなく、ごまかすこともなく、疑問は疑問として、行き詰まりは行き詰まりとして、それと向き合う30年。差し置かざる力と言うべし。これはなかなかないような志であるし、こんな、まあ、大根と書いてありますけれども、こんな大きな根気。強い根気を持った人はなかなかいない。霊視の剣豪なる伝聞するは枠十教官なり。えー、ここはあの水野八百子さんの注釈を見てもさまざまな英訳を見てもみんなこの枠十教官の解釈の仕方が違う。水野八百さんは長兄の志の堅固なことを伝聞するのは、教官により真実を学ぶことであるというふうに説明されてますが、私にはちょっとわからない。霊視の堅固なる。要するに、うん、この長兄の志の硬さ。伝聞するは枠十教官なり。そのを伝聞するのは、水野八百子さんによれば、教官により真実を学ぶことである。うん、私はむしろ、このような志の。まあ、このような堅固なる志こそ、まあ、仏教を伝える教科の、まあ、材料となるし、なぜ、まあ、要するになぜお経があるかというと、まあ、沢木老師がお経技前の注釈だというふうだけども、なぜお経が残されていって今でも読まれるかというと、こういう志を伝えるためこそお経がある。まあそういうふうに読んでます。えー、水野八百子さんの解釈の仕方がちょっとここではわからない。うん、願うべきを願い、はずべきを恥とせん、長兄にそうおうべきになり。願うべきを願い、はずべきを恥とせん。要するに、ちゃんと願うべきことを願って、そして反省すべきことを反省する人。内山老師が、安泰寺へ残す言葉の中で、一座、二行、三心と言ってますけれども、一座はつまり座禅。そそれこそ一座というわけですから、そこで並び立つものはないけれども、その中身と言えば、三下と聖願、あるいは聖願と三下と言います。で、三神は天祖教訓の鬼神、老神、大神と言いますけれども、菩薩としての聖願が座禅の内容でなければいけないけれども、なかなかそれができない。それに見合った毎日の生活を送ってない自分がここにいるわけです。えー、まあ、内山老師は一切分の一の自分と一切分の一切の自己という言葉を使うんですけれども、私たちはみんな一切分の一切の自己を生きていながら、この一切分の一に過ぎないこのボンプも同時にやっている。でこのボンプが一切分の一切の事故に目覚めて、それに向かって修行するのは聖願。ところが、一切分の一切が今度一切分の一の自分を振り返って
、それができないということに気づく、そこはまた賛成が、えー、賛成の心が起こるんですね。えー、この西岸と三下に対応するのはここでは願うべき願いと恥ずべき恥ですね。こういう西岸と三下を実践する,する人は長慶にそうをすべきなり、この長慶に出会って、この長慶を自らの鏡と思えばよい。ところが実を論ずれば、ただ同心なく創業、つたなきによりて、いたずらに、妙理には、けばくせられるなり。悲しいかな、えー、本音を言えば、みんな同心がない、修行もつたないもの、そのために、自分のエゴ、自分の妙理、自分の評判、評価など、それだけ。気にしてそれに束縛されているんだと、えー、こういう話ですここからしばらく英語で説明したいと思います Today's、uh, part starts、uh, with the story of Master Choke Elio as he's called in the English translation in the Japanese he's called Erin Um, the Nishijima translation starts with、uh, 234 in brackets, and on the left side I see 140c.、Um, I will first read the Nishijima translation. Master Choke Elyo was a venerable patriarch in the order of Seppo. Going back and forth between Seppo and Gensha, he learned in practice. For a small matter of 29 years. In those years and months, he sat through 20 round cushions. People today who love Zazen cite Choke as an excellent example of an adorable ancient. Many adore him, but few equal him. His 30 years of effort then were not in vain. Once, while he was rolling up a summer reed screen, he suddenly realized the state of great realization. In 30 years, he never returned to his home country, never visited, visited his relatives, and never chatted with those on either side of him. He just directed, directed his effort single mindedly. The master's maintenance of the practice was for 30 years. For 30 years, he saw his doubts and hesitation as doubts and hesitation. He should be called one of steadfast, sharp makings and should be called one of great qualities. Tidings of such firmness of resolve are heard sometimes following the sutras. If we desire what we should desire and are ashamed of what we should be ashamed of, then we may be able to meet with Choke. Honestly speaking, it is only because people lack the will to the truth and lack skill in regulating their conduct that they remain idly bound by fame and gain. Um, Gensha was the topic of、uh, the last part, which I talked about two months ago. If I remember right, I think Gensha was a student of Seppo.、Um, so Choke studied probably first with Seppo and then、uh, with his former Dharma brother Gensha for 29 years. And Dogen Zenji. Takes it, takes it as a sign of proof of his well, commitment to Zazen that he sat through 20 round cushions, to, through 20 zafus.、Um, so actually, it's, it's exactly 29 years since I came to Antaishi and I sat through a couple, but 
less than a dozen, far less than a dozen. So the one that I'm using now, I've been using for at least 10 years or so, I would say. Um, it's not in the best shape, but still, I'm wondering how Seppo managed, not Seppo, but Shoki managed to set through 20. Maybe he was moving a lot during the set. Uh, because if you sit still, there's not much stress on the cushion. Or maybe the cushions at the time were not the highest quality. But uh, again, um, here this episode is used as proof that Choke was really serious about his Zazen practice. He said more than everyone else. So people today who love Zazen cite Choke as an excellent example of an adorable ancient. Many adore him, but few equal him. His 30 years of effort then were not in vain. Once, while he was rolling up a summer reed screen, he suddenly realized the state of great realization. Um, that's kind of a, f not a funny sentence, but kind of in, in the Gyoji chapter, Dogen rarely mentions uh, the enlightenment experience of the patriarchs. That's kind of one characteristic of this chapter that he talks at length of the hardships that the ancestors went through um, but he hardly talks and uh, rarely talks about the enlightenment experiences which probably also has to do with uh, the time when he wrote this chapter um, he, he had already s solved his great doubt when he came back from China at age 28. And he had established his own monastery a couple of years later, south of Kyoto. But then around the age of 40, probably the topic came up of moving to the mountains uh, of uh, Echizen, today's Fukui, and build Eheji there. Um, And I could imagine that both Dogen Zenji himself and the people around them were not quite sure if that would be the right thing to do. There were so many people more that they could reach in the capital than going to the mountains. And uh, life in the city would be much easier than in the mountains. They didn't know what was waiting there for them. Uh, Dogen Zenji risked his life when he traveled to China, but the temples that he visited in China were all big temples that had support from the Chinese state at the time, um, he didn't really know what it would be to build a, a temple there from scratch in the mountains. And uh, well, there's a lot of talk about snow and cold in this chapter, but I mean, it gets cold in Kyoto in the winter, but there's not really lots of snow there. and. Uh, the places in China that he visited, I think he didn't really have so much uh, there in the snow or cold to endure. But then Fukui is a different thing. It's kind of a, well, it's a similar climate to here. There's lots of rain, lots of snow. It's deep in the mountains, not so much sun. Um, so he reminded himself of Bodhidharma and all the others that could have had an easier life, but for the sake of practice and for the sake of transmitting this way, went to the mountains and endured these hardships. But then there was also this event here um, that during this 30 years, once when Shoki was rolling up a summer reed, he suddenly realized the state of great realization. So they have a double realize here, realize, realization. The Japanese is basically Daigo, big, he had a big Satori. And you probably know, um, on the internet, if you want uh, to have a Shobo Genzo 
translation of the, uh, the different chapters, you can go to a site which is called the Zen site, and they also have this Nishijima translation, and as an alternative, they have the Shasta Abbot translation, which is a little bit different. I will read this as well. Um, the venerable monk Choki Elio was a revered senior monk training under Seppo. For 29 years, he went back and forth between Seppo and Shibi, exploring the matter through his training with both of them. Matter with a big M. That's one of the um, characteristics of this translation, that very often they use um, capital letters for words which for them probably have special importance, in this case the matter. Exploring the matter with a capital M through his training with both of them. During those months and years, he wore out 20 sitting mats. There are people today who love doing seated meditation and citing Choke. They take this beloved ancient one as their model. Those who idolize him are many, those who are equal, those who equal him are few. At the same time, his efforts for 30 years were not in vain. There was a time when he was rolling up a bamboo blind in the doorway of the meditation hall and suddenly had a great awakening. So they go for great awakening here. Um, Nishijima has realizing great realization. Um, I will get back to this soon. In 30 years, he never returned to his home country, never visited his relatives and never chatted with those on either side of him. He just directed his efforts single-mindedly. The master's maintenance of the practice was for 30 years. For 30 years he saw his doubts and hesitation. His doubts and hesitation. He should be called one of steadfast, sharp makings and should be called one of great qualities. In Japanese, doubts and hesitation is gi tai. Gi is doubt and tai means to get stuck. Mm, or oh, that's one of the meanings. Um, so it's not that these 30 years were kind of straight path and then there was this big enlightenment experience and um, that's the whole story but uh, for 30 years he saw his doubts and hesitation as doubts and hesitation um, One small detail here is um, Dogen Zenji makes this point that for 30 years he wouldn't return to the home country, never visit relatives and never chat with those on either side of him. So in Zendo. Um, you have, well, obviously two neighbors left and right. Um, often you find in books, like in biographies of prominent monks, often you read that after three years or five years in the monasteries, they didn't even know the name and the face of their neighbors. And that's to emphasize, emphasize how serious they are about their practice. Um, here Dogen doesn't go as far as say that he didn't even know who was sitting beside him, but he didn't talk to his neighbors. Whenever I read something like this, especially when people claim that a monk didn't even know who was sitting beside him because he was so serious or facing the wall, basically, looking at himself. Um, I wonder where well, their efforts were actually directed. And if that kind of that focus of practice is what we are trying to do here. If that would be kind of productive attitude in Antaiji, where if after a couple of years you still don't really know who's sitting beside you, or well, you, you have a certain idea who they are, but you never talk to them. Um, 
except for maybe the minimum amount of talk that's needed to, to get uh, Samu done, but then after Samu you return to your room and sit facing the wall. Um, from my point of view, that would be a very narrow focus of practice and Yeah, if you don't even know who is sitting beside you, who, how are you supposed to help all sentient beings with your practice? And that's the point he makes about Bodhidharma, when Dogen Zenji writes about Bodhidharma. That was the reason why he came to China, to save all uh, human beings. Well, if you never ever had a small talk with your fellow practitioners, how are you supposed to save all human beings. Then there's the question, um, what was this uh, realization of realization or that big awakening um, that he had after 30 years? It happened when he rolled up, uh, well, summer red, red screen, it says here in the other translation, it's a bamboo screen, I think. Um, in the case of Dogen Zenji, they say that he had an insight in China when uh, Dogen's teachers admonished his neighbor who was sleeping. Xin Jin Datsulaku, he supposedly said at the time, and Dogen Zenji dropped off body and mind. Um, there's other episodes like this. At one time, supposedly, the Buddha held up a flower and Mahakashapa, his student, uh, smiled, started to smile. And um, that's how the way was transmitted. Somebody had a realization when they saw peach flowers in the spring. Another cleaned the pathway in front of their huts and a stone flew and it hit bamboo, they heard that sound, and the person had a realization. Um, then there's the story of uh, Gensha. Um, his teacher held up a finger, and Gensha had a realization, and he would use that for the rest of his life. Whenever people asked him a question, his answer would be this. And then he had a student who imitated that. And all for Gensha didn't invent, invent that Gensha, basically copied his master. When his student copied him, um, he didn't think that was good and he called the student to him and when I think he asked him a question, the student raised his finger, he cut off the finger. Um, and at that point, the student didn't have an awakening, but the student ran out of the door crying and Gensha called him back. And when the student looked back, Gensha raised his finger and then obviously there was some realization. There's also the story of, what was his name? Was it Toksan? I'm not quite sure of the name of the guy. He had to talk until late at night with his teacher and the teacher said, well, it's already late, you know, you should go to sleep. And reluctantly, the student uh, leaves the hut, but it's dark outside, so his teacher gives him a candle. Here it's dark, take that candle. And the moment the teacher takes the candle, the teacher blows out the candle and it's completely dark again and the student has a realization. And I think it was Ummon, but I'm not quite sure if he was in the student's position or the teacher's position. There's a story involving Ummon and again, the student wants to have a talk, an interview with his teacher, but the teacher, I think, doesn't want to even let him in because he's busy or whatever, he's annoyed. But the student... Um, so persistent that he, he's trying to close the door by force, try to get in. And Umon shuts the door so heavily that he breaks uh, the, the leg of his student. Or maybe it was, I think it was Umon who shut the door and the student who broke his leg. Um, another guy left the monastery after a couple of years of practice in desperation and decides to see other teachers and then he hit his toe 
on the way down the mountain. Um, having a realization. So what is happening in that moment? I think it's simply that in those moments, moments, these people return, well, to say it flatly, to, to the here and now, which is basically where we always are. We're always in the here and now, but we are good at, or at least our attention is pointed somewhere else. We are always in the here and now. We're always in the present. Where else would we be? But the attention is pointed somewhere else. And when we look for the Buddha Dharma, for example, we look for it, well, here and there. We look for it in a book. We look for it in a Dharma talk. Um, we hope to get it in tomorrow's Sazen, maybe, to get a gris grip or a deeper understanding of the Dharma and what we forget is what is happening in this moment and something like strong pain something that can get somebody back because in that moment there's no room to escape if it's really a strong sudden pain um, that's something that can get you back. And when you were until then in that mode where you were looking here and there and then right out of a sudden, you pulled back. You can have this realization, oh, what was I looking for? This, this is me. Everything that's happening in this moment is me. But usually we think, well, here that's me part part of reality that's me and over there that's my teacher and and there's those books that are written by wise people and somewhere around here i don't see it yet but somewhere here there must be the answer but actually the answer is is the space where all of this happens and a pain can bring you back or sometimes it can be a flower that's blooming or in this case um, Choki when he rolled up the summer reed probably at the moment he did nothing but just roll up that summer reed and forgot about everything else about all those uh, doubts and about this uh, hesitation And realized it was always I was always in in that thing that I was looking for. But then I think it's interesting that Dogen Zenji says for thirty years he saw his doubts and hesitation as doubts and hesitation. So <clears throat> um, Probably everybody here as well has doubts and hesitations. Sometimes you get stuck. You wonder if this is really the right place for you. Um, if you're not wasting your time, like on the whole page it says minimum three years, but three years is a long time. Um, is it really worth three years of my life to be here? Um, it would be strange if, if somebody here says, oh, I never had these doubts. Usually you ask yourself regularly, what am I doing here? Maybe I'm wasting my time. Maybe I should go somewhere else. And what do you do? when you have these doubts or when you think that you get stuck in your practice. You can, for example, you can pretend, try to pretend to yourself that you don't really have these doubts.
pretend that everything's fine. You can think about all the alternatives and try to convince yourself that the alternatives would be even worse to what, what you're living right now. Okay, there's uh, this other teacher, there's this other monastery, there's this other possibility, but actually none of them are perfect, so I'd rather stay here for the moment. And well, Choke for 30 years saw his doubts and hesitation as doubts and hesitation. So he didn't try to somehow fool himself about the fact that he had these doubts and that he hesitated. He took them at face value. When he was in doubt, he was thoroughly in doubt. When he got stuck, he thoroughly got stuck in his practice. And that's why Dogen Zenji said he should be called one of steadfast, sharp makings, uh, someone of great qualities. Mm. Yesterday we had this talk about um, sleeping in Zazen. Mm. And often I'm asked what you can do when you feel sleepy during Zazen. And I still haven't found a good answer yet. One thing to try is what I also said yesterday, rather than have this deep abdominal breath, why not actually make a point of breathing with the breath and breathe in deep and then breathe out deep, which is not the usual way of breathing. Um, abdominal pain, when you just breathe out, you allow the breath to go out. And it's a long, deep breath, breath breathing out. Usually that helps you to relax, but When you sleep, often it's because you're so relaxed that your body falls asleep. So when you move the attention upward, or another way of breathing is, is what they do in Goenka retreats for the first three days. They tell you to um, watch how the breath touches the triangle above the upper lip. So thus you, you concentrate on the nose why you breathe neither on abdominal breath nor on the breast breath but your concentration is in this area it's basically the, the actual breath that is going through your nose and touching uh, that triangle that's also something because you're you're moving your consciousness upward that might help you to stay awake Kezan zenji says in the text called zazen yojinku when you feel uh, sleepy move your consciousness upward put it on the head Top of, tip of your head or put it on the tip of the nose and when you, f if you have too many thoughts and you f uh, start to get nervous or tense then you should move your consciousness consciousness downwards have it in the tandem area below uh, the navel or put it on your feet so you can experiment like with this Like with drugs, people talk about downers and uppers, I think. So that there's drugs that make you more awake. Um, but then, of course, less relaxed. And then there's drugs that calm you down and make you more relaxed. But that's not the drug you want to take if you have to, some work to do, for example. You're so relaxed that you well, can't concentrate anymore. And in Zazen as well, I mean, there's, there's the state where you're more kind of in a, in a downer state. You're relaxed, but maybe less sharp and more prone to sleep. Or there's this uh, state where you're, you're sharp, but then you have more thoughts. So if you tend to sleep, you might 
want to try to well, get a little more, bit more sharp. And one thing we were talking about yesterday was, um, well, John said, uh, or Hosen now said, um, if he's thinking a lot, he's less likely to sleep. So I said, well, why do you think? Why don't you think then? Um, think about, well, Japanese kanjis or whatever. And uh, Hosen said uh, correctly, well, Zen isn't about thinking. So it's often said that we're supposed to let thoughts go uh, during Zazen, which is right. Although then when you're actually sitting there with the thoughts, it's not so easy to let them go. How do you let a thought go? Well, one thing that is not so difficult and that has been practiced for a long time in the history of Buddhism is you return to the breath. Uh, so you get a thought, you realize I'm thinking, and in that moment where you realize that, you don't have to have a, how do you say, second thoughts about that, oh, sh shit, I shouldn't have been thinking, I'm not supposed to be thinking there. The moment you realize you're thinking, you return to breathing. You realize how you're breathing out, how you're breathing in. Or you can return to the posture. You return to the posture. It's likely that during that process of thinking, also your posture changed to a certain degree. Often the, the thumbs, for example, they move when you start to think. Uh, you can return to the posture. Or one thing is uh, return to, to the sounds. Right now, when we start to sit at four o'clock, usually it's completely still in the hondo, except for, well, somebody sleeping, for example, or making uh, noises while breathing. But usually at four, it's completely silent. But at six, a lot of insects and birds uh, make sounds. And they start at one point after half past four, before five o'clock, usually they start. But often it happens that you're sitting the Zen and in the beginning it was quiet, but then the next thing you realize, oh, there's quite a lot of birds. So what happened in between? Well, often you don't know because your mind was somewhere else. But that's also something that can help you to, well, stay in the moment, awake, and let go of thoughts when you try to be completely with the sounds. Or in the evening is the other way around. At six, there's quite a lot of concerts still going on and sounds, but at eight, it's completely quiet. And again, it can happen that quarter to eight or so, you realize, oh, now it's really quiet. When did the birds stop to sing? And maybe the next day to try to actually be there when they stop to sing. Your mind being there when they actually stop to sing. So, so another thing, um, when you realize I'm thinking, another thing where you can return to is to the sounds. And we were talking about, well, thinking. Um, Thoughts can also sometimes help us stay awake, or here um, Dong speaks about doubts and hesitation, or you get stuck in your practice. Also, doubt is something that can keep you awake. Um, but as uh, Hosen said, um, we're not supposed to think during Zazen, or we're supposed to let them these thoughts go. Um, I wouldn't recommend this practice to beginners, but I mean, you sit here for 1,800 hours a year and after a while you get a little bit more stability. So what you can also work with, just the same as you can monitor the sounds during two hours of Sazen and try to be with the sounds. You won't be 100% successful for two hours, you will always somehow get off for a while, but then you can return, you get better at it. And after a while, you have a kind of overview of what actually happens during these two hours, sound-wise. You, you, you have an overview and, and you know in the morning
morning when they started to sing and, and which birds there were. You don't have to name all these birds or whatever, but, but you, you get an overview of that. And you can, although it's much more difficult, you can do that with the thoughts as, as well. So when you start to think, rather than let go of the thoughts by moving your mind to something more simple, for example, to the breath or to the sounds or to the physical uh, posture, you can stay with the thoughts and observe what happens, just like birds. A thought usually continues for a while, it changes, but then it disappears. And then there's another thought, and another thought, and another thought, but they all disappear after a while. Um, but again, this is really super difficult. Um, you might have realized that with uh, insects and the sounds that birds make is kind of easy to just watch them as they are without getting caught up in those birds. Or I, actually, I never met anybody who came to untie you and complained that he could concentrate on Zazen because the birds make so much noise. Nobody complains about the sound of birds. But um, normally we would have a session starting tomorrow for five days. And the May session can be one of the most noisy sessions in Antaishi because it's the holiday session, uh, season and this is one of the few seasons uh, where we actually often have visitors or there's people buzzing around the hondo sometimes looking for wild vegetables and stuff like that visitors that make a lot of noise and Especially if you speak Japanese. If you don't speak Japanese, it's not so much of a disturbance because it's just noises, but without a meaning. If you speak Japanese, then you start to get annoyed by it because you understand the words and you get caught up by what they say. Which is usually nothing important, but, but you kind of you're annoyed that here I'm sitting so then and now they talk about the wild vegetables and, and, and uh, this and this and this. Um, so although these people just make noises the same way that bird make noises, when you understand the meaning, the tendency is that you kind of are carried away by the meaning. And it makes it almost impossible to just see it as sounds. And even more difficult, it becomes with your own thoughts. Because these always also have meanings. And the things you, you think, these are my thoughts. And you either think, well, I have to follow that thought. Or the fo thought invites you to follow it. Or you think, well, I must not follow this thought. I have to somehow let it go or I have to suppress it or I have to change it into something more positive or whatever. Um, but it's not impossible, but it's a very difficult uh, practice. But if you take it serious, it's also something that might help you to stay awake. That when you start to think and you realize I'm thinking, you can either try to let these thoughts go and return to something else, breath, posture, sounds, or you can stay with the thoughts without allowing them to take you away, but you still see them and you observe them and see how they change and disappear and then new thoughts appear mm. well you can try it and you will realize how difficult it is but it's not impossible mm. if you think it's too soon then try something else like stay with the breath stay with the posture uh, stay with the sounds え、ま、
と言って、ところが考え事をしているときはあまり眠らないと。だったらじゃあ考え事をすればいいじゃないかと私が言ったら、でも座禅は考えることじゃないでしょうと彼が言って、まあ、その通りだけれども。よく、まあ、座禅中は考えを手放すべきと言われている。で、そのためにどうしたらいいかというと、まあ、簡単な方法は呼吸を見るという方法があります。自分の姿勢に変える。考え事をしていると、多くの場合は姿勢がちょっと変わっていると、例えば親指がちょっとずれたりとかすることがよくあるから、姿勢に変えて、この姿勢を整え直すと考えがおのずと手放されるあるいは音の世界に注意を向けるこの時期だと4時間はまだ完全に静か音は頭に居眠りする人の音が聞こえるけれども朝4時はほとんど音聞こえないけれども6時は多くの虫たち鳥たちが鳴いているいつから鳴き出すちょっとすると気がついたらもう泣いているという座禅がある。つまり泣き出した時に自分の心はちょっと別のところに行ってた。本当に自分は今ここ、この五感を済ましていれば泣き出した時に気づいているはず。で、次のやつが泣き出したり、で、最初に泣いてたやつはまた病んだり、別のやつが泣き出す。夜はその逆6時座ったらまだ多くの鳥たちが泣いているけれども8時には静かになったいつから泣きやんだか自分の心が音の世界と共にあれば気づくはずだけれどもまあ私たちの心があっちに行ったりこっち行ったりこの音の世界にすら気づかないことが多いで考えに関しては手放すと言われているけれども、えー、実はこの考えも同じように手放さないで音のようにただ見るという、まあ、非常に難しい修行座禅があっていいと思いますね。難しいのはなぜかというと、考えの場合は自分は見ているつもりでも気がついたら考えの中に自分が飛び込んでこの考えに連れて行かれることがほとんど。呼吸を見ている時ですら呼吸を見ているつもりで考え事をしてしまっているということが多いから最初からこの考えを対象にして座っていると気がついたら自分は考えを見ているんではなくて連れて,連れて行かれているということがほとんどだけれどもこういうこともまあできないことはないしましてや居眠りしそうな時は考え事をしていると眠らないというんだったらじゃあこの考え事をするんじゃなくてこの考えがいかに起こって、起こった後、どうなっているか、コロコロ変わって、いつの間にまた消える。鳥の声と同じように、起こっては消える。起こっては消える。その中に自分が飛び込むんじゃなくて、その考えに連れて行かれるんではなくて、今ここという安定したところにおいて、それをまあ見守るという。そういう座禅もある。ただ難しいのは難しい。うん、もう一つ、まあ、ちょっと気になったのは、この人は右と左の人と30年間談笑しなかったと言われている。たまには3年経っても5年経ってもまだ隣の単の人の顔をすら知らなかったという人の話を聞くさまざ、あ、まな偉いお坊さんの、まあ、電気でそういうのを読んだことがある、えー、もうそれだけ熱心に壁に。向かって座って自分と向き合ったから隣に誰が座っているかその名前も顔も知らない
それをどう考えたらいいかまたあんたたちにそういう人がいれば逆にやりづらい周りの人にとって総理にとってもそういう人が中にいると逆にやりづらいなんでやりづらいかというとその壁を見ることだけが自分を見ることじゃないその隣に誰が座っているかそれも見てもらわないといけないし隣の人の名前を知らないと。いかにまあその人の世界が狭いか、でまあその天地いっぱいの事故だとか、一切分の一切の事故とはなしだけれども、出会うものすべてがそのはずだから、隣に座っている人の顔すら知らなければ、何が一切分の一切の事故、何が天地いっぱいだということなわけですから、まあ、あの、談笑しなかった、あの、座禅これから座禅なのにいつまでたっても世間話をしなかったということなんでしょうけれどももしそれが本当にもう隣の人に全く見向きもしないで自分の世界に入ってしまったんだったらちょっと困るもう一つまあ直接これと関係してないけれどもあの昔から、えー、まあ、天台修羅士官という言葉がある。マカシ官とか天台小士官、えー。こういうふうに書くのかな。止めるに。見る、えー。これはもう要するに道元禅寺から古くある。えー、で、死というのはまあ心を止める。Uh, 南方僕よりサマ,サマタと言うんですね。で、見る方は今日本でも流行っているビッパサナ。で、まあ、この中も参加した人は何人もいると思いますけれども、あの今、日本でも例えば京都府に五円下流のビッパサナ、リツリートに参加できる。参加すると何をするかというと、まず3日間、シャマタをする。さっき言った、ここの三角に集中する。そうすると、心が、まあ、集中力が上がって安定してくる。この死の方ですね。で、残り1週間、まあ、10日のリツリーターから残り1週間は、ビッパサナ、体全体を観察する。これは見る方ですね。で、発祥道には、えー、少年と少女という言葉がある。この少年は、まあ、マインドフルネス、ビッパサナ、正しく念ずる。で、これは英語に訳されると、right、マインドフルネスと訳されてます。で、少女が最後になりますね。これは7番目で。これが8番目、最後になるんですけれども、これはサマーターで、英語では right concentration と訳されている。とか right meditation。What's the eighth of the eightfold path? The last one? こちらが、マインドフルネス。Well, I think、uh, I, I might be wrong, but I mean, also depends on the translator. But often the seventh one is translated as right mindfulness, and the last one, right concentration.、Um, in the Zen, there are a lot of things that are not the same. The Zen is 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 not the same. とかもう2つには分けないけれどもまああえてこれを分けて考えた場合はこの情というのはまあ集中力ちゃんと今ここにまあピンとあって要するにこの情の反対は
ボケティル状態ですね。もうボケティル人はこの情が足りない。うん。だからスリッパーがちゃんと揃ってないとか、それを注意する。なぜならば見えてない。で、この「上力」という言葉もあるけれども、上の力。これを高めるのに、まあ、ずっと呼吸を見るという方法。あるいは、これはもう今なくなったけど、須,藤須田同期さんという人は、座禅してる人の前に演奏を掛け軸に書かれて演奏を置いてその真ん中に一点点が書いてあったんですねその演奏の中の一点を見つめさせたという,う他にはあまり聞いたことのない工夫それをまあ方便として使ってたらしいんですね本人から聞くとまあ方便と言って座禅をする人に一点一点だけに目を合わせて座禅をさせる。そうすると、上がるのはこの上ですね。ここが、上で、まあ、さまた、死ですね。心が安定してくる。ところが、念というのは、あのまあ、内山老師はよくその座禅の風景とかそういうものを言いますけれども座禅している時はさまざまなものが起こる、えー、雑念も起こる体の感覚もあってそれが変わったりする自分呼吸がそこにある音の世界がある。で念というものはその全体を見渡すいかに自分の視野を広げられるかということですね、えー、まあカメラで言えば情報というのは一点だけにピントを当ててそこがはっきりしてくるけれども念がないとそれこそ自分の隣に誰が座っているかそれすらわからないような状態あの一点、壁の一点だけを見ている、あるいは自分の呼吸だけを見つめている、この簡単でだけに集中して、他の世界は全く見えてない。これは、まあ、情があっても念がない状態ですね。念があって、情がないと、全体を見ているつもりで、結局全部がボケているという状態ですね。何にも。全部を見ているつもりで、本当は何もちゃんと見えてないという、そういう状態もあるんですね。で、座禅で習っているのは、両方。全体を見渡しているけれども、はっきり見えている。それぞれのものが、それぞれのものとして、はっきり見えている。で片方だけをやっていると、例えばその居眠りばっかりをやっているとか、考え事ばっかりをやっているというのもそれと関係していると思う。要するに、視野は広げているけれども、全然ピントはどこにも合ってないというと、多分眠ってしまう、いつの間にか。そのリラックスしてオープンになっているんだけれども、そこからついつい居眠りに入ってしまう。情だと、まあ自分が集中すべきところがあるから、意識は冷めやすいけれども、まあ、一点だけだから、一点だけだから、それが本当の安定というか、自分の本当のよりどころとなってない。不安。うちも一点だけだけど、そこが不安定になっているというか。その
一つのものにとらわれている呼吸を見たならば呼吸だけに結局とらわれてしまっているというこのまあ昔はこれは分けて常時だけれども座禅ではどちらも大事だよと結局つながっているというつながりの中でこれをやらないとダメだとだから道元禅師もこういう分け方をしないと思う Um, so, in the Eightfold Path,、uh, second to last, you have right mindfulness, and then the last is, would be right concentration. And in the Tendai sect before Dogen Zenji, they had something called Shi Kan. And Shi means to stop, and Kan means to view. Shi con- corresponds to Samata, and Kan to Vipassana. And Vipassana again. Corresponds to Nen or mindfulness, and Samatha corresponds to Jo or concentration. And in Zen, you need both, and usually we don't divide these two, but Jo or concentration means that you are really focused, your mind is present. And that's why it's, for example, important that, well, if you take off your shoes, the shoes are right beneath each other because, well, your mind has to be there.、Um, so, in the, if it would be kind of, as an example, we use a camera and you take a picture, you have to adjust the focus. You want the picture to be sharp. But, In Zazen, there's a lot of things happening. In one hour of Zazen, there's the sounds,、um, there's the physical perceptions, there's the breath, there's thoughts coming and going. And、uh, Uchiyama Roshi often speaks about the landscape of Zazen. So, this dimension here is kind of describes the amount of. What you see, how wide your focus or how wide your attention is. So, in the case of the camera, it would be well, how much you, you actually have in the picture, how, how big your attention is. And in Zen, you want both, both is important. You want to be aware of. The whole reality of what is happening right now, but it shouldn't be blurred. If you have only a wide and open mind, but none of this, then it will be all blurred. And well, you think you're wide and open, but actually you're only dreaming, and the next moment you're sleeping without being aware of that. If you're always focused and in the here and now, but you don't have this, then you're only focused on what you want to focus. For example, when you Take care of the shoes, you do that, but you forget about everything else. Or what often happens when you're the tenso is、um, you're doing the tempura and you're concentrating on that. And、uh, you got the right temperature there, but then you forget that、uh, five minutes ago you opened the hot water for your fudo, and because your mind is concentrated, but it's concentrated only on the tempura, and you forget about. The Ofulo. Of course, when you open、uh, the hot water for the Ofulo, you can't wait there for 10 minutes and just watch the hot water going in and, and forget about the tempura, or if the telephone is ringing, you ignore that.、Um, so, the same with、uh, Zen. Sometimes it's helpful if your thoughts go all over the place and your attention is floating all over the place, but in reality, it's nowhere. You just think. You're attentive, but in reality, you're nowhere. It can be helpful to return to the breath, but if you do only this, then, then also your, your reality is very small. So,、um, that's also one reason why I was a little bit kind of thinking or in doubt about this saying that for 30 years he never talked to his neighbors.、Um, because that could lead one to the idea that. Your true self is somewhere behind that wall that you're facing in the Zen. So you, 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 you really have to focus on the wall so that finally you get towards the true self that must be somewhere beyond the wall. No, I mean, your, your neighbors are just as 
good a part of the true self as your abdomen or your breath or uh, what you have in the books or whatever the sounds of the birds is just as much as the true self as, as your neighbor so of course having a communication with your fellow practitioners is also part of the practice um, but then of course chit chat is something that can also take your way that's why we say of course you don't talk during uh, zazen um, but then it often happens that people talk a lot during samu so what's the difference if it's okay to talk during samu about things that are not related to samu why don't we talk during zazen as well Well, we don't talk during Zazen because we want to be in the moment. When you talk, you're also talking in the moment. But what you're talking about usually takes you away from that present moment. So that's why we keep silent during Zazen. And for the same reason, it's usually worth to keep silent during Samu as well. When you realize, actually, I'm engaging in chit chat and I'm not really where my hands are in the works of my hands it's a good idea to return to that but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't even know who we practice with and and what these people um, have in their minds and about their emotions so we connect during break time and we connect on Hosan with these people it's not that for 30 years we don't want to have a conversation with anybody. Um, okay, um, I thought I would get ahead quicker than I am. One and a half hours. Um, now we come to a different Zen master and this part is actually a little bit longer than the one with Choke. So maybe I'll stop here for today and continue with uh, Isan Zenji next time. Honto wa moto susumeru to omoimashita kudo domo. Tsuzuku Isan Liyu Zenji no anashi ga moto nagai no de so as always if you have questions please please feel free to ask Yes, please. Um, in the beginning, you said uh, Dogen moved to the mountains for the sake of the two Dharma, something like that. Hmm. But, well, there's the vow to a vow to save all beings. So why why would you mm -hmm. move away from where many from the capital basically mm -hmm. to the mountains where almost no one can reach you? Like how how can we interpret? Um, yeah, as, as talked a little about it in, in Japanese, but I didn't say that in English. Uh, so basically, um, Dogen Zenji belongs to uh, what is called Kamakura Buddhism, uh, which started around the year 1200. And um, the people who started it were, well, Honen. And Shinlan, they started uh, Pure Land Buddhism. So they preach that you can reach salvation through uh, only through the help of Amitabha Buddha. So you uh, chant Namu Amida Butsu. Um, then the last of these uh, Kamakura Buddhists was uh, Nichilen, who said you can reach salvation only through the help of the Lotus Sutra, so you chant Namu Myoho Lengekyo. Mm. As you all know, uh, Buddhism started with Shakyamuni Buddha, so um, 
in all of these schools, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is important, but for the Nem Butsu Buddhists, for the Pure Land Buddhists, Shakyamuni is basically important because he taught the people at his time that there was a Buddha who lived already before him, Amitabha Buddha, who promised to save everyone, even the most evil person who can't practice. Um, so basically for the Pure Land Buddhists, Shakyamuni is important because he informed us about Amitabha Buddha. And for the Nichiren Buddhists, um, Shakyamuni is important because he taught the Lotus Sutra. So basically for the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni was the tool that the Sutra needed to become manifest in this world. So, so actually for them, if they had to choose between Shakyamuni Buddha and the Lotus Sutra, it would be the Lotus Sutra. Uh, that's important. And Shakyamuni was necessary for the Lotus Sutra to manifest in this world. And for Dogen, it's all about uh, Zazen. And Shakyamuni was basically the, the, the first who exemplified uh, Zazen through his practice. Mm, but it's not that we pray to Shakyamuni, but we learn from the practice. And it's for him, it's only Zazen. And then there was uh, a guy called Esai. And uh, if you read uh, history books on Kamakura Buddhism, you learn about that in junior high school in Japan. Usually you learn, well, there was Esai and he started Rinzai Zen, Dogen started Soto Zen, Honen started uh, Jodo sect, and Shinnan start, start, started the Jodo Shin sect, and Nichiren started the Nichiren sect. And one thing that most of these guys have in common is, or all of them as far as I know, they started out as Tendai monks. They ordained in uh, Tendai sects and they studied first as Tendai monks. And the practice that later they taught, they were all part of Tendai practice. So they actually chanted the name of Amitabha also in the Tendai sect. Um, they took refuge in the Hokkekyo and they also practiced meditation. The difference uh, between the founders of the new sects is that they said you can do only one thing. You have to make a decision for one thing. So if you practice Nembutsu, do only that and forget about the whole rest. Uh, Nichiren said, well, you can take refuge only in one sutra. So taking refuge in the Hokkekyo, the Lotus Sutra, because that's the best and only true sutra. And Dogen said, well, if you do Zazen, only do Zazen. Um, in the Bendo Wa, he says you don't even need to prostrate over incense, uh, read the sutras. In the Zuimonki, repetitively, he says, don't read anything, uh, just practice Zazen. So for Dogen Zenji, it was only Zazen and not Zazen plus something. And that's the reason why all of these guys got into difficulties. So Honen and Shinnan and Nichilan were banned from the capital. Um, at the time, they had what is called in Japanese Shimanagashi. So people were banned to an island. They had to go to an island for a couple of years, or sometimes even a second decade, what they did with Napoleon. Uh, in the European uh, history at one time that they, they sent him to an island. So they wouldn't kill these people for some reason. They, they could have killed them as well. Or well, Some Buddhists were also killed at the time. But with others, they said, okay, we don't kill you, but please go to that island for, and we don't wanna, want you back for a decade or two. And probably Dogen felt that... Um, he might have the same destiny if he not either leaves the capital or makes a compromise. And uh, the other person who didn't have to leave the capital uh, was Esai, uh, who is credited with founding Rinzai Zen. But um, there's a little bit a problem with this saying that Esai was the first Rinzai monk because he never officially left the Tendai sect. 
It was, well, when he founded Kenninji, I think it was still a Tendai temple. So, like, Tendai was like a university that covered all of Buddhism at the time. And e Esai founded, well, the Zen section of that university. But he didn't say, well, this is the only thing you could do. So it was kind of something that Tendai monks could do if they wanted to meditate. They could come to Kenjinji. So Esai was pretty good at arranging themselves with the Buddhist establishment at the time. And Dogen could have done the same if he wanted to stay in the capital. But he felt, I think, that, well, he couldn't make a compromise. He couldn't say that, well, Zazen is just another approach among many. But rather, actually, well, he says um, in several spots, I think, that he basically thought he was the first who brought Buddhism to Japan. When Dogen Zenji lived, uh, Buddhism had been in Japan for 500 years. But Dogen Zenji says, well, the sutras have been in Japan for 500 years, but there has been no Buddhism. And the proof for that is, well, there's nobody who dedicated themselves to the Zen 100%. People were doing meditation on the side. But if they had understood that when Shakyamuni said under the Bodhi tree, that's all what it's what it is about, and people would have done that so far. So Dogen Zenji, at age 28, came back to Japan, came to Kyoto and said, there's no Buddhism in Japan yet. I'm the first one to bring it here. And, and people didn't like to hear that. And of course, he could said, have said in his 30s, oh, sorry, I was wrong. I'm just one out of many, and all of you are also practicing. We're all brothers in the Dharma, so let's let's get along with each other. He could have said that, but, well, we don't know if we would have Soto Zen today, or if it would have been absorbed by Tenda. Um, so you're right, uh, and I think that's also a reason why Dogen was in doubt. Should I go there to the mountains? Will there actually be somebody listening to me? That's in, in, in Kyoto, I have much more people that I can reach, and my impact much much be much bigger, but I will either be sent to an island or I have to make a compromise and water down to my, my teaching to a degree where I could rather, well, just shut my mouth and become one of these priests with their fancy robes that sits in a rich temple, but I'm not practicing the Dharma anymore. But apart from that, I think, I mean, he died at age 53, so he wasn't the most healthy person, probably. I think he wasn't really the guy for the mountains, and probably he felt that himself. So actually, I might, I might cut down the length of my life when I go there uh, to the mountains, and yeah, who knows if I will find any students. But he thought it would be better than making a compromise and make arrange himself with the Buddhist establishment of his time. Okani Ali Masenka, anything else? Please. I have a question, but it's not something that sort of came up in your mm. Tesho. It's something that came up in my Rinko, which I was sort of... It's often said that practicing Buddhism is about clarifying the great matter of life mm. and death. Yes. How do you sort of perceive that? Because when I sort of thought about it, or at least attempted to think about it in a more sort of understandable way, I sort of couldn't quite pin down some sort of meaning like what is the great matter of life and death? Um, well, for me, it's pretty simple. Like, 
none of us really knows why we were born, why we are here in this world. Um, and all of us know that we're gonna die, but we also don't know when that's gonna happen and we don't know what's gonna happen afterwards. So we don't know what came before birth, and we don't know why we were born, we don't know when we die, what's gonna happen after that. And also nobody really knows what to do with the time in between these 70, 80, maybe 90 years that we have. As kids, we're told that, well, first we have to uh, learn to use the toilet and then tie our shoes and then ride a bicycle. And then we're sent to school and told to make our homework so that we get good grades. Why that? So that we can get a good job and later earn money and if we get rich we might find a beautiful wife and have children and build a big house and drive in a fast car and why would we want to do that well everybody wants to do that and, and then also your children then maybe later will get to good school and um, also become rich and have beautiful wives and then you have lots of great grandchildren. But then, I mean, that's the big, the big matter or that one matter of, of life and death. <clears throat> when you realize that I will die and my wife will die, my children will die and my grandchildren will die, then the question is, of course, why would I want to waste all my energy and time to play that game that everybody is absorbed in but it seems to be, well, pretty useless when you think about the fact it's going to end. And all these, these points that you scored during the game, they're all going to be taken away from you anyway. Uh, all the money you earned and all the sex you had and all the food you ate and all the cars you drove, uh, you can't take that with you after you die. So, so for me, the great matter of life and death is, is the question, well, right now I'm here in the world. I don't know why. And I'm going to don't know what's going to happen later. But I have today and maybe also tomorrow and then another day, who knows. But what can I make out of today? And, and sometimes I put it like this, I think I, I try to explain it like this also in past uh, Dharma talks. So, so one point of practice is to, well, just stop that game for a while and realize you don't have to be a player in that game. There's no need to get absorbed by the game. So you just, especially during the Zen, for an hour, you just stop the game and... You're not this player anymore. You don't try to score any points during Zazen. That's also the reason why we say Zazen is good for nothing. You don't get any points for Zazen. You stop playing the game and just see, well, what's there? What's happening? Without worrying about points, about where, get, uh, worrying where you get there as a player, as this one player that you are. Right now you're one out of six here. But during Zazen, you forget about being one out of six or whatever. You're just the whole of reality. And then the other half of practice, which is just as important, is that at one point you return to the game. That's why I emphasis is it's actually not good if after 30 years you have never communicated with your neighbors. You don't even know their names. Um, in Mahayana Buddhism, it's essential that you return to the level of the game, but you play with different rules. You try to change the game from inside. So you don't try to escape from the game and say, oh, I don't want to have to do anything with the game, but 
as I need something to live, please give me some food. So you go to bed in the morning and then you eat that in the afternoon, then you meditate in the evening. But apart from begging and getting the food for the day, you don't want to get involved in the game in Mahayana Buddhas, you say, yes, let me play with you, but maybe there are different rules with which we play. Who decided that it's all about money and sex and cars and, and delicious food? And why does each of us only think I'm this player and I need to get as many points for this guy? Why don't we play together as a team? It's one whole team and there's no other team. I think that's what Mahayana Buddhism is about. But before you try to build this team awareness first, you have to, well, get a little bit out of the game. Because we're sore, the tendency to get absorbed into the game and to be to identify with only this one player that we call ourselves is so big that first you get out of that and the Zen is one way to just stop the game. But then it's also important to get off the cushion again and to connect with people and raise this awareness of hey we're playing only a game here and Maybe the game is much more enjoyable if we play with little different rules. That's how I see it. The great matter, matter of life and death. You have maybe even less than 70 years. I mean, you can die in your 30s or 40s. But you have this time on this planet. You don't know why you're here. You don't know what's going to happen afterwards, but you know you're right here. How do you use this time? How do you use this time? You don't want to hmm, play the same game that everybody else plays. Otherwise, probably you wouldn't be here. Unless that's what some some people do. They, they think that this search for enlightenment is also just another part of the game. So they try to get the enlightenment and then they can impress the girls when they get back to their home countries. Hey, I got enlightened, got my Dharma transmission in Antaisi. Uh, do you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, probably there are more efficient and faster ways to impress <laughs> your girlfriend. <laughs> ま、<笑> の、
その,その今にいようと思いながら、うんうん、今から離れたいっていう何か違うことを考えていて自分をそれまでの自分を保ちたいっていう,なんかこう葛藤が起きてるわけですね。それは、ごめんなさい、葛藤という解釈が正しいのかわからないんですけど、そういう状態について、何かこう、どんなふうに解釈されますか、うん、あの以前も澤田さんとこの居眠りについて話したことがありましたよね。その時に、澤田さんがその座禅中に寝るのは逃げだって。というようなことを言ってましたよね。あ,あ、そうですね。似たようなことを前の話しておりますね、うん。まあそういう居眠りもあると思いますね。あの一つの逃げ道として、今ここに痛くない心が居眠りとか眠りの中に逃げ込んでしまうというのはあると思いますね。で。まあ、あんたたちではそれは聞いたことがないけれどもあの禅宗の中にも稲森座禅は悟りに限りなく近いものだという人がいるんですね。何が近いかというと眠ろうと思って眠っているんじゃなくてまあそれこそ無意の働きもうそこで私というものがない気がついたら眠っているわけですね。まあ、その眠れない人はおそらく眠れ寝たい寝たい寝たいと思って布団に寝ているけれども眠れないでまあいつかは眠れるけれどもそれはもう自分の努力の結果として眠ったんじゃなくてそれこそもう手放し思いの手放しで眠っているだから眠るのはどこが悟りに近いかというとその自分ができるものではない。むしろ自分の力を超えておのずとまあその藤田一生さんで言えばもう自らじゃなくておのずから眠るただ要するにそこに自分の意識がないわけですからそこはまあつまらない要するに仏教では目覚めることが大事ですからこの私できない働きが今ここに現れているそこはもう眠りと近いんですけれどもそれに気づいている何かが気づいている気づいているの何かがここにあるこの気づきも私が気をつけているから気づいているのじゃなくてこの気づきだって私の気づきではない何かが気づかせてくれているというそれがまあ座禅が狙っているものだと思うんですね。今ここに置かれて、そして気づかされている。現実が現れる。誰が気づいているか、それもはっきりしない。何が気づかせてくれているか、それもはっきりしないけれども、気づいているという事実がある。で、澤田さんの質問は、そこに、うん行こうとするというか、うん、今ここにいようとするのにじゃあもう一度お願いしますいやそうですねだからここにいようとしているのに、うん、なんでしょうねえっ、ー、と要は考えがどうしても浮かんできてしまうっていうそのなんえっ、ー、といいってこう座禅の状態にしたいと思っているのにいろんな考えが浮かんできています、うん、で、うんえー、とよくあるお話は浮かんできたものをどうするかですよね。うん、なんですけど、うん、そうじゃなくてそもそもその浮かんできてしまうその浮かんでくる勢いはどこから来てるかなと思ったんですね。うんうん、で浮かんできてる勢いというのは実はその今ここにいるというふうにしようと思って座禅をしている自分を。邪魔しようとしてるものがあるんじゃないかなっていう,、うんう,んうんうん、そ,そうはしたくないというもう一人の自分がいて、うんうんうんうん、本当はあそう座禅をしてる自分はそういったものから離れて今に来ようと思っているのに今に行くべきではないというなるほどその抵抗する気持ちというのがそういうの
呼吸、まあ、一つはその居眠りかもしれないんですけど、うん、居眠りに流れるものかもしれないんですけど、うん、その考えてからはっきり起きていられるっていう状態もやはりその今いることを邪魔しようという,こう、うん、もう一人の自分の働きみたいなものが。なんかあるのかなっていうようなことをちょっと話の流れの中でちょっと思いながら聞いていたっていうことなんですけれども、うん、まあそれは古くからまあカルマという言葉だとかあの道元禅師の言葉にも衝動の因縁という言葉が出てくるんです衝動はその要するにこの道,道を邪魔する、はい、道を妨げる因縁が古くからあっていきなり座禅して全部手放そうと思ったってそこはもう自分のその条件付けられている自分が座っているポンプとしての自分が座るわけですからそれこそ内山老師の10年10年10年というような長い時間をかけてで座禅だけ頑張ってするんじゃなくて生活すべてがそれを中心に整っている。だからまああのさっきの発想どうでもあのまあ少年とか少女も大事だけれども気づきだと集中力も大事だけれどもまあ正しい言葉遣いだとか正しい生活正しい行い正しい努力なんでそれが大事かというとそれによって自分のカルマが変わったりそれをこの自分のどうしてもまあ任せてしまっているスイマーだとか考えだとか今ここからよその方へ引っ張ろうというこの力はやっぱり生活全体この24時間の生活を整えることによってそしても長年かけて出ないと変わらないと思いますね。だってその自分の体の健康だってその1週間2週間でどうにかなるもんじゃなくて長年食事生活を変えて睡眠時間を変えて運動とか始めてようやく変わるもので自分の心もそれ以上多分時間かけないといけないそうでなければわざわざこういう総理のを作ってでその総理の中でもまあ最低10年やってみろいと言われないと思いますね。だからまあ昨日彼にもじゃあその実際に夜寝てるのは何時かというのも聞いたそのただ単に睡眠時間が短ければある程度はまあ眠,な眠らなければいけないから。<笑>いくら気合い入れたって毎日4時間しか寝てなければまあ東福寺はそれだったそうすると体が勝手に好きさえあればいつでも眠るだからある程度、うん、夜眠らないと当然座禅中に眠ってしまうというのもあるしあるいはでも過去にあんたにも過去たくさんあったけれども夜も眠ってて朝も眠って、接心だったら昼も眠って、夜も眠って、<笑>ほとんどいつも眠っているという人もいる。それはおそらくまあカルマというか、その澤田さんが言うその逃げというか、今ここに自分がいるということはあまりにも辛くて、眠った方が楽で、そこに心が逃げてしまうという、癖がもうついてて。うんはい、はい、ありがとうございます。他にありませんか。まあ、明日からは接心じゃなくて、リツリートですけれども。<笑>まあ、日頃、あのー、みんなおのおの自分を中心だと思ってなくて、まあ、総理を全体を見渡して行動してくれていると思うけれども、まあ、明日からはリチュリートの参加者を中心だと思って
So tomorrow we won't have our monthly session but uh, retreat and um, you all know that Antaji is not about you. Um, you're supposed to create Antaji, you need to create Antaji but uh, it's not your personal individual creation. You have to forget yourself and uh, have the eyes wide open for the whole Sangha. It's not about you, it's about the Sangha or that famous John F. Kennedy quote in Antaji would be not, it's not about what the Sangha can do for me, but what can I do for the Sangha? And tomorrow, for uh, five days, it's going to be about the people who come here. So, um, see what you can do for these 16 people that will spend five days here. And yeah different than a session but probably just as challenging or even more challenging with that amount of people coming and the small group of people being here but let's do our best and hope that they will have a great five days some of them are only coming only for that purpose to japan so hopefully they don't regret that they spent all the money and time to get to Antaji for five days. Hey.